Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric, and I'm here with kindergarten cop, my mom will shoot Michael Kester. I didn't, I, yeah, I got nothing for that. Um, what are the movies I just said? <laughs> you said kindergarten cop and stop or my mom will shoot in some way, shape, or form, I guess. Those are, in fact, the two movies we're talking about today. I think the basic plan was to take two of Hollywood's biggest action hero stars and exploit the fact that in the 90s they were reduced to doing comedic roles. Yeah. Because explosions were out in the 90s. <laughs> well, I don't know if that was true. I think they were. I think the 90s was when Kung Fu kind of started to happen again. This was a very distinct time for this type of movie. And I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, seeing it before the 90s and uh, kind of more of the modern take on it. But in order to do that, of course, we're going to have to spoil the films. Yeah, that's just a, something you got to do. It's a big part of what we like to do on this show. So you can use chapters, which is a feature in the show you've never heard about before. I can't, you know, I can't even talk about chapters with a straight face anymore. It's just, <laughs> uh, talk about chapters in my sleep. Anyways, use the chapters to skip the movie you both care about but haven't seen. Which right. is, I don't know why both I, of these would, would be, be true. Yeah, both of them. Especially on today's episode. But you might be really invested in Kindergarten Cop and you just haven't gotten around to it yet. You can uh, skip over to Stop or My Mom Will Shoot, which you also haven't seen, but are somehow really invested in and don't want to get spoiled. Yeah. The internet is a fickle bitch. Uh, why don't we start with um, Kindergarten Cop? All right, so Kindergarten Cop is probably Arnold Schwarzenegger's most notable film, right? It's well, that's a weird thing, isn't it? I mean, it, it, we haven't talked about Arnold probably since... Uh, At least Expendables. Yeah. And I mean, the last time we really did one of his movies was T3, right? I mean, Yeah. The last time we really did one of his movies was T2. You don't count T3? At least in T3, it was really Arnold and not, uh, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger's a, face. Super a wax robot, on, yeah. Christian Bale's body? Is that how that movie went? <laughs> I think, yeah. Or Jeremy Renner. I don't remember. It was one of the Avengers. We'll, we'll get to the um, the Arnold stuff. I want to talk about some of the other weird people in this before they just yeah. disappear into the 90s. Okay. Um, the first one was Ivan Reitman. Yep. So, director of Kindergarten Cop, and then did a bunch of other very 90s things, right? Yeah, he did. Uh, so, we got Ghostbusters. That's probably, right. yeah, would you say, was... most famous and commercially successful? I, you know, I don't actually know about the commercial success of Ghostbusters. It feels like one of those movies that was a flop until retroactively everybody loved it. But yeah, it could be. I don't know. I think it's definitely got enough cult appeal to say it was successful. But it also did Stripes, which is very popular. Right. Um, a lot of Bill Murray. Twins, Junior. <laughs> this is where we start to get into the Stranger Things. But a lot of the, um, a lot of, produced a lot of stuff as well, all the way to recent times. Yeah, he did. And in fact, I believe he produced Stop or My Mom Will Shoot. He did, as well. in fact, produce Stop or My Mom Will Shoot. Yeah, so it's possible that just every movie is actually produced by Ivan Reitman and we just haven't noticed yet. Yeah. Um, not the, uh, not the really bizarre one. The bizarre one is Linda Hunt. Yeah. Who, I feel like it's a name that comes up all the time, but then I think about, okay, what do I actually know that Linda Hunt has done? Mm -hmm. I know Carnival. She yeah. plays uh, <laughs> the voice of management. Um, I don't believe the uh, the body of management, but the no. voice of management. Right. No spoilers there. And uh, voice in God of War. I mean, yeah. You just So this is a fun exercise. Every time I say this is a fun exercise, I feel like the exercise is always stop watching and just listen to the movie. That's what I'm going to tell people to do again on this episode is watch Kindergarten Cop without your eyes, just your ears, when Linda Hunt is on the screen. And uh, yeah, it's that creepy voice that people use in video games and in Carnival and uh, Linda Hunt. You know, conversely, you can do a similar experiment wherein you mute the television when Arnold is in the room with the kindergartners. Sure. And it becomes a far funnier movie. <laughs> Because what? Why Sam's dialogue, it's Arnold Schwarzenegger making some of the most terrifying faces ever and children crying. Yeah, I don't think Arnold knew at this point 
where his niche was in film. Yeah. He, um, you know, I thought about that on Total Recall, too. I guess that was an Arnold movie we did. Oh, yeah. And there's also some weird Arnold faces in Total Recall. Yes. That's part some of, are not actually his face, but yes. It's, uh, yeah, that was movie magic, I think is what that is. But <laughs> Arnold... Texas switch. Arnold, at some point, got really good at, okay, this is what I do. This is yeah. what I'm known for. Mm -hmm. And there was a long time where we knew we liked Arnold, but we weren't yeah. really sure why. He had our vote, but we, he wasn't quite governor. That's, That's I wasn't saying. gonna make a governor joke. Oh. I was saving all my jokes for Richard Tyson, but I guess we could. Just... <laughs> Can we talk about yeah? What is it, Colin Crisp? Right, Colin Crisp, who wears the stupid giant talking head suit yeah. through the entire movie. Just this ponytailed '90s action movie villain. He barely a villain. Barely a villain. Right. Yeah. I don't. I'm not afraid of him. At There's any this point. thing in the '90s that happened in a lot of. Um, I don't want to say action movies because I'm about to compare it to the the first Adams Family film. Okay. You know, you have this thing that kind of transitioned from the 80s where you need an evil villain that you can hate. Right. But the 90s was this weird movement in film where they tried to make everything something that the average Joe could identify with. I blame the LA riots. I blame everything on the LA riots. But Okay. So you have this thing where instead of Hans Gruber, the ultimate fucking bad guy who has no remorse and is only out for his own gain and previously you know of decades prior that was the action movie villain too yeah it was exactly the, you know the foreign terrorist yeah and now you get this thing in the 90s where it's a mother-son duo <laughs> um yeah that where was you have the son who ends up being the muscle but he's actually the focus right and then you take a step back and realize that his mother is the puppet master, but you question her motivation the whole time because the way it lines up is that Cullen Crisp should be the one who wants to get his family back. Right. But he is for whatever reason, too dumb to, <laughs> sure. to know that he wants that. Sure. And so he relies on his mother to tell him that's what he needs. Yeah. And to, to put the gun in his hand and send him out. Right. Which, which again, I don't know if you remember when we did the Adams family, but it's, uh, it's when uh, Fester, before he's Fester, and his mother are trying to take the Adamses for all they're worth. Oh, yeah, Fester yeah, Fester yeah. is the focus, but his mother is the puppet master. Sure, sure. And I kind of kept seeing a similarity between those two and Cullen and his mom throughout this film. And it really just, it added a comedy element that the film was desperately missing. I uh, I didn't think about his mom so much. I guess I'm just so focused on what a weird guy he is. But yeah, you know, I think I've suddenly found the reason why he's a mama's boy. That's yeah, the you know the whole manicure line and just the movie constantly feels like he's not a tough guy villain. Yeah, he is. I mean, he's a mama's boy. That's what it is. <laughs> a ponytailed, long haired '90s movie <laughs> villain mama's boy. And that's the weird thing about kindergarten cop is that it's packaged as a comedy the cover has colorful lettering and building blocks and and arnold schwarzenegger holding a kid by his pants or something yeah right but it deals really deeply with mommy and daddy issues almost on an uncomfortable level sure, sure. Um, which i mean i want to get to kind of the undertone of that but specifically the point where Arnold Schwarzenegger stands in front of the class. Or sorry, what's what's his? I, can't, I always forget his name. Detective John Kimball. Yeah. Yes. So Mr. Kimball is standing in front of the class, right? And this is after he asks how many kids were born in Oregon or California or whatever, and they all raise their hand. And then how many weren't, and they all raise their hand. Right. He uh, he says, "We're gonna play a game. It's called Who Is My Daddy? Who's Your Daddy, and What Does He Do? Right. And we get this slew." of really, really vivid images of all the things a father can do to let their kids down. It's never my dad, you know, comes home from work early every Friday and takes us out to get pizza. Yeah. It's always my dad is a deadbeat. My dad has a lot of sex with my mom. Sure. My dad is gone. My dad hits me. You know, yeah. all the, my dad's a gynecologist. <laughs> I mean, well, there's also that that strange kind of domestic abuse or child abuse yeah. thread through the whole movie too. Yeah, it's pretty. It's one of those movies that isn't. Uh, it's not bad Santa style dark. It's more dark. Like uh, if you think about it a little too much, it's doing some fucked up things. Uh -huh. 
you know, it tackles all of these things that are, it's not, a, I guess it's not diving into them very deeply, but if you were to sit here and think about, okay, everything that the kids said about their dads, this isn't a very good picture of, you know, stable family household. Right. Also, you know, they talk about this being the single mom or single parent capital of the world right. or whatever. Which is suppo- – it's delivered in this hilarious you can get laid easy package. Right. But then the film just goes on to show all these really broken families. And sure. it's weird because the film is packaged as one of those lighthearted comedies. Yeah. And it ends up being a coming of age, inspirational, weird – but that was the 90s. There yeah, was never yeah. there was never an honest film in the nineties. You don't think so? <laughs> no. Every film was every film was trying to Trojan horse something about, you know, the the moralistic avenues of American society. Well, yeah, or it was the moral responsibility of Hollywood. Right. Well, that's because the eighties was so devoid of that. That's why we spend so much time in the eighties on double features because devoid of moralistic Hollywood. Well, we're it's not I don't, I mean, yeah, moralistic Hollywood, not devoid of morals, but where films aren't beating you over the head or, or even betraying themselves so that they, you know, seem like a redeemable film. I guess when a movie can be a couple different types of dark like this, yeah, I prefer the, and maybe it comes from it feeling it needs to deliver a moralistic message, but uh, there's a movie that comes off as being really dark and really edgy yeah but is actually the content's pretty safe sure i think i almost like true lies is that's what you're talking about (laughs) i think i like the opposite better i think i like when a movie uh looks just movie that's what you're talking about and (laughs) well i did that that one's hard because you know when you're watching it that it's a little fucked up yeah but it's almost like a pop song with really dirty lyrics you know what i mean that uh that britney spears do you you know what i'm talking about the um no what there, she had this okay so i know everybody loves when we talk about music on double feature there's this britney spears song is this happening right now trust me it's awesome she had this single i'm sure most most people have heard it but she had this song um probably three or four years ago and it was called if you seek amy like if oh, you're looking sure. for Amy, yeah you know what i'm talking about yeah i totally know what you're talking and, about and, Way hip. and she Way got hip. it on the she got it on the radio it became this you know international britney spears pop song hit. Sure. and then eventually someone somewhere realized she was spelling fuck me yeah right um, <laughs> i do remember that and that is actually the most awesome forgettable piece of uh britney spears trivia yeah it's fucking beautiful but yeah that guy i mean even maybe even less subversive than that just pop in general, I think, has a tendency for people to, you know, sing along without thinking yeah. about what they're really singing sure, about. Sure, totally. And watching a movie like Kindergarten Cop, it seems like uh, G-rated. You could show it to anybody. No homework. You know, no, no homework. But it has just the safest little bit of edge to it. Yeah. The you know they're poisoning hamsters and the kid punches the girl or whatever yeah. <laughs> or i love that kid they talked to you know uh did she die did the person she go to visit die right. everyone yeah, dies the kid who's obsessed with death yeah it's just a little bit bleak yeah. for some reason yeah and if you dwell on it, it even for a second too long you realize the movie's kind of dark yeah but the movie just nope keep going pop song this has to be uh has to be accessible for everybody right well that's the thing that this movie has in common with uh, action films, the mm-hmm. fucking movies, you know, fucking, I always think for some reason, when I think of Arnold Schwarzenegger action movies, everybody goes to Terminator or something like that. But for me, it's always commando. Sure. Yeah. Because it's, it's the movie that was a vehicle for Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. There's predator and there's Terminator. And those films became these massive franchises with spinoffs and action figures and fucking whatever yeah. predator now stands on its own without Arnold Schwarzenegger. Terminator sure. has its own TV show where they never once mention Arnold Schwarzenegger. Right. You know? I mean, they mentioned the, the sure, machine, sure. but it's not built around his stardom. Right. Commando is a completely worthless piece of film, except <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger is an action hero. In sure. It. And that film and this film have one really strong thing in common. And it's the flat one liners that aren't funny, but then you laugh at them. Sure. You know okay. what I'm talking about? Where, it's it's to go along with the the subversive moralistic thing or the subversive kind of dark edge. It's a subversive comedy tactic where someone somewhere, when they cast Arnold Schwarzenegger in a comedy film, said, this guy's not funny. He's not a comedian. He's Conan the Destroyer. Yeah. But if we give him 
bad one-liners, he's going to try so hard to deliver them that that yeah, maybe will it'll be, be funny. funny. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like there's some funny in the, you know, the ferret. I mean, the ferret, <laughs> the ferret, it's a hamster ferret too, which is, it's just this wonderful best paradox thing ever, of yeah. mindfuck. But well, cause it saves the day at the end. Yeah. Well, you know, he says he never bites. I, you know, the reveal of the ferret, they're trying to have this touching <laughs> moment, you know, telling, uh, telling you yeah. about the kid and the light piano. Right. Oh, sorry. I forgot. This is my ferret. <laughs> I have, I have a theory about the ferret and it's that at some point during shooting, the writer, uh, was on set and Arnold Schwarzenegger said the word ferret. Ah, uh, and realized that there was comedy gold in that. Yeah, in just hearing Arnold Schwarzenegger repeat the word ferret over and oh, over. Oh, that's and my ferret. It's not even the word, but the the whole phrase. That's what gets me. Oh, that's my ferret. Oh, say hi to my ferret. Hey kids, do you want to see my ferret? I can't even I can't even think back to it now without right. just losing it. But, you know, it's not just his voice, like you pointed out. It is um, his interaction with the children and his faces. There's sort of a mixed bag of Arnold Schwarzenegger, what the fuck is, is happening. Watching him interrogate and yell at the, <laughs> the children. That's kind, of, that's kind of the, that's the one-line pitch of the film, right? That's mm. Arnold Schwarzenegger teaches kindergarten. Yeah, I guess that's it. Yeah, so it is, uh, in a lot of ways, I think it's built around him. I, you know, of course, it's 100% built around him. But I mean, I don't know if Kindergarten Cop would exist if it were any other action star from the 90s. You mean like Stallone? Well, I think Stallone has, so Stallone is too cool of a guy. Yeah, there's some perfect mix of Arnold where it almost seems like he didn't quite know he was that's kind stuck of, in the... That's kind of the whole point of this film for me that's that you just you just hit it on that he uh that you don't know if he really knows what's happening exactly yeah you're not sure if he knows that he's not that funny or you're not sure if he is fully aware of the type of movie he's doing well and so it's very distinct for arnold even though you've kind of seen him in roles like that before i mean the reason I really wanted to do Kindergarten Cop on the show yep. is because I fucking miss Arnold Schwarzenegger. Me too. But I'm really glad because um, that, uh, what's that one called? Well, he's got two coming out. He's got The Last Stand now. That's the one. And I think uh, the one with Stallone is called The Tomb uh, that's coming out after that. So, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of new Arnold stuff coming out now that he's out of politics. And I'm thankful for that. I missed Arnold in cinema. Yeah, me too. And there's just something about starting to see these trailers. You know, I went to see, uh, I think it was when I saw Looper that I saw the trailer for The Last Stand. And it was suddenly like, oh man, here's here's Arnold on a big screen. Sure. Uh, Expendables 2, you know, has, uh, has Arnold oh, yeah. in it. It's just um, seeing him again, it's not even nostalgia so much. I don't know what it is. Something about it just makes me happy getting back to... Oh, that guy's going to be in movies again. Right. Well, he's he's even reprising um, his Conan role. He's going to be in the new Conan movie. That seems to be his talk about a lot of stuff these days. And, and he's got Terminator 5 coming out too, apparently. Yeah, and they wanted to do triplets. I mean, oh there's... Oh, my God. No. I, I don't, I, yeah, right. I don't know how many of these movies are actually going to get made. I read a new Arnold Schwarzenegger story every week about... Well, Expendables 3. New... We can at least count on Expendables 3. Yeah, got the fingers crossed for that. That's going to be all right. Oh, my God. I'm so excited. Yeah, and I'm okay with him you know, revisiting all of these franchises that are long gone. Sure. Something about Arnold doing that is, you know, when Stallone does it, and we talked about that with Rocky, and we'll get into that a little bit more on Stop or My Mom Will Shoot, but uh, Stallone revisiting the franchises feels like it has this kind of integrity that makes it okay. Right. Well, it feels like he's taking something that has fallen into obscure camp. And fixing it. And is and, and he's basically going, all right, listen, it's 2012. Right. We're going to make this uh, relevant again. Yeah, but when Arnold does it, I felt like it was always kind of an obscurity. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like like the camp place that it lived uh, that we're going to go back to is okay because it was always, always yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. The thing I wanted to say about Kindergarten Cop, though, is that I do think it's one of his most distinct roles, oddly. I mean, you think about, you know, we wanted to do Kindergarten Cop as opposed to something like... Uh, true lies or whatever yeah because he has this body of action films and we want to talk about those eventually and we've talked about a few before but he's got uh you know action films and science fiction films and he's also got this weird breed of 
how did I wind up here comedy? Yeah. And we haven't talked about any of that yet. And for some reason, Kindergarten Cop sticks out in my head the most. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have Detective John Kimball, which is the, the funniest fucking, you know, he starts as a Terminator character. Right. And by the time he's, he does that clean shave and then it's like, mm -hmm. Arnold, how did I end up here? You know, fish out of water comedy. Right. I love the insulting notion that a cop could even do the job of a kindergarten teacher. <laughs> yeah. Like that's, yeah. that's the whole fucking premise of the movie. And just the thin, I mean, the Richard Tyson, why we have to, you know, go undercover, the whole thinly veiled premise. Mm -hmm. They're relying on everybody going, we want to see Arnold as a kindergarten teacher. We don't really care why. Yep. No one is going to ask about what he's doing here. Mm -hmm. And this isn't, you know, this isn't the first time he did this. I mean, we have Junior. And we have uh, Junior was the pregnancy one. Right. Twins, Twins is the other one I'm thinking yeah. about. This is sandwiched in between those two movies. And then uh, Jingle All the Way yeah, later. That's right. right. So this wasn't just a one off weird thing for him. This was a thing he kind of did a lot. Yeah. Arnold has the action stuff and he has the sci fi stuff and he's got this weird thing. Well, that's that's I mean, and that's what happened in the 90s is these guys who were big action stars had to start doing comedy movies because the big action films weren't drawing people anymore sure um and that i mean that's well and then there's the question of oversaturation i mean even if the action films are always doing great you know this is a way to go well let's get comedy fans into it too right. how can we expand the arnold uh franchise and oh well we'll try other genres this is something that i think action stars did before this it was most prevalent in the 90s but we mention every time Vin Diesel comes up, um, we did, what was it? The Iron Giant was the last one, I think. Yeah. Where we mentioned it. We'd never really done a big like Vin Diesel movie or anything. But we talked about him being in The Pacifier, and we make jokes about The Pacifier every once in a while. But what was that? I mean, that's the same thing, right? Vin Diesel has to babysit some kids right. or take them to soccer practice or something. Yeah. This idea of, um, you know, taking these big action stars and making them go get, you know, groceries and run around screaming kids throwing a tantrum right. all the time. The thing that really gets me about when Arnold does it, and specifically in Kindergarten Cop, is there's no action here. There really isn't any action in this movie. No, there's, there's not. barely weapons. You know what I mean? Yeah. They stay far away from uh far away from the action stuff. Right. And that's one of the things that I kinda wanted to contrast it with Stop or My Mom Will Shoot over, because that is something this movie has a little bit more action to it. Well, it does. This film is is far more a clear vehicle to put an action hero sure. in a comedy. A little more swappable. This is still, I mean, it's a high concept movie. It's there's a mom in the police force now, right? <laughs> but right. the film of Stallone in the police force is still there. Mm -hmm. It's just there's a constant foil. But that doesn't take away from the random explosions. It doesn't take away from the caches of weapons. Sure. It doesn't take away from the, the sexual aspect. It just puts Estelle Getty right in the middle of everything. Well, and that's something that happens a lot in the cop drama, I think, too, or in the, uh, the sort of cop subgenre of action movies. The buddy cop movies. <laughs> yeah, I really mommy wanted cop. to avoid saying that. But yeah, the mommy cop movies, the buddy cop movies. Yeah. I mean, that's why you have the buddy part of the buddy cop film sure. to make it light and accessible and funny. That's where it sure. attempts to be funny. Well, and, and this is this is kind of a this is a double whammy because of what I was just saying about Kindergarten Cop, where now we have a mother and son on the other side of the law mm -hmm. and she's still the puppet master. It's just he's 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 not taking it anymore because he's somebody that's supposed to be you know, a big shot. Yeah. Right. But it's taking the same aspect. And instead of it being a manipulative woman and her dimwit son, it's a out of touch woman and her bullheaded son. And they have to get past that in order to win the day. Yeah. Stallone, I guess, is only half of the package when yeah. you're, you know, looking at, uh, looking at what carries the film. Sure. Well, you have Stallone and he's, he's kind of the big Hollywood name, but then you have the mom from Golden Girls. Sure. Who, I mean, the name Estelle Getty really doesn't resonate with your average moviegoer or your average, I mean, even your average person. Right. You say Sylvester Stallone and people know Rambo and Rocky and Cliffhanger and Cobra and, you know, the Expendables and whatever the fuck. But if you see the mom from Golden Girls, you know who it is. Sure. Estelle Getty has this really interesting 
film, I, I guess acting career, um, not just film, but she was born in the twenties or something. God damn it. Really? The twenties. Yeah. And she really didn't come to prominence until, you know, the, the late seventies. And, and obviously when she played the mother on the golden girls, if ever, if anybody who's listening, if any of Podmanity is not familiar with the golden girls, you're right. wrong. Well, golden girls was what? Uh, 80s, it was, it was the, it was the mid and late eighties, but then there were two spinoffs, both of which Estelle Getty was, was in the third spinoff or the second spinoff, rather the third show uh, called Empty Nest was the star after all the daughters have finally left. Estelle Getty was still there. Oh, sure. Then there was one in the middle. I don't, it was the address of the home. I don't remember what it was, 1900 or 1800 Mockingbird Lane or whatever the fuck. Sure, right. That was, I think, short Betty White or B. Arthur. It was one of the girl. one of the girls had left. Right. And anyway, so the Golden Girls specifically, but the spinoffs are all pretty decent too. The Golden Girls is this great piece of 80s tv because it was this way to empower an entire demographic that didn't even know they needed to be empowered <laughs> sure it was sure, a way right. to empower the demographic of you know past you know uh silver fox aged women right who are still single but they're still virile and they still want to go out and have sex and have fun and go on dates and this show was just a way to Go ahead and say, look, you can do that. Even your mother can do that. Yeah, right. right. And so Estelle Getty became this poster child for women who are okay to, you know, women who can get stuff done past their quote prime, right? Sure. So she ends up being the poster child for an entire demographic. Well, so is Sylvester Stallone. Right. He is, he is the face of men who are men right he is the one you look to when you're thinking of i want to be as tough as sly stallone and those two demographics butting heads seems like the perfect way to <laughs> put a movie together i mean that's that's what i would think yeah is you take women who don't need to be bossed around by men who have lived their entire lives devoid of the need of a man and you put them in control of the manliest man there is yeah, and then I, it makes me wonder, well, then who is your demographic? Right. I mean, so you've got a concept at this point. I know we're getting really exploitative uh, producer's chair here. Yeah. But when you're seeing Stallone kind of get cut down like this, demasculinized, right. which is a big part of what I wanted to talk about on here, uh -huh. kind of the gender roles and the role of masculinity. Are masculine guys signing up for that? Are the people who are into Stallone films signing up for that? What was the idea? I, you know, I don't know if they even thought that far. If you look right. at the two, they didn't think that far is the answer. If you look at the two people who are helming the project, you have Ivan Reitman. Uh -huh. We already talked about him. He directed Kindergarten Cop and and several other movies. And then you have Roger Spottiswood, who is the director of this film. Mm -hmm. And he directed Terror Train, which we which we did on the show a while ago. I don't think we ever did Terror oh, Train. We never did Terror Train, man. Yeah, that was uh, on your playlist of That's slasher right. That's movies. What it was. I needed to see during yeah, your one. Yeah, that was my boot camp, but that never made it on the show. Well, let's add that into list of things we need a double feature. But he also did the Sixth Day, which is the uh, oh yeah one of the big one of the big Arnold action comebacks. <laughs> sure. Um, so yeah, how do we not mention that? That's a niche market that he's very comfortable in. And so it's difficult to pinpoint where along the way they didn't feel like they were going to be alienating Stallone's entire audience. Yeah. I mean, Demolition Man came out right after this. Sure. So it's not like Stallone had lost any credibility as an action hero. I mean, prior to this film, not necessarily through this film, but I'm just saying this wasn't a, a low point in Stallone's career. Yeah. This was, he was still cruising off of Cliffhanger and tango and cash. I, don't, I think I have to stop you at cruising off of yeah. cliffhanger. <laughs> I don't sorry. think you can do that. I think uh, when Stallone's acting next to Rob Schneider in <laughs> no, several right. films, and, Sandra Bullock. and that's not the low point. I mean, I think I think a lot of let's say Stallone historians would argue that Stop or My Mom Will Shoot is the yeah, low point. Yeah, but it's isn't it's this Stallone's most hated I film don't think or whatever? That anybody? I don't think anybody downloaded today's show thinking oh finally they're talking about the cinematic masterpiece stop exclamation point or my mom will shoot my favorite part of that movie is when stallone says stop or my mom will shoot <laughs> right right well we're talking about the three point scale yeah, right no i mean we're on. back on um children of the corn yeah yeah the three point scale 
it, it's actually come up in my life a lot lately. I was explaining it, it to a few friends of mine. I don't remember what I was talking about, but the three point scale is this idea that if you look at something, you know, X out of 10 stars, say you're rating something out of 10 mm-hmm. and you're rating a bunch of stuff. So, you know, some of it gets tens and some of it gets ones, but you know, five different things all get threes. Well, three point what? <laughs> right. If you're trying to rate those in regard to each other, you can then you create a second 10 point scale, right? Right, right. I believe that's known as the decimal points. Uh, is where and that the, is. Uh, the end result is you get five movies who are all very deliberately better or worse than one another, but they're not outside of a three out of 10. Yeah, and we started talking about that on the Killapaloozas on Children of the Corn to begin with because there were 27 movies in that franchise. And on IMDb. They're pretty much all somewhere between 3.1 and (laughs) 3.9. So when we're talking about those movies that day, we can't come in and act like, well, I guess we have to come in and act yeah. like one is the holy grail and one is the worst film ever It becomes ever made. an exercise in relativism. Right, exactly. It's our way to try and be both objective, but also to be excitable. Sure. You know what I mean? We, we, nobody downloads this show to listen to us talk shit about movies anymore. Yeah, I believe that's every other podcast yeah. on the internet. Yes, yeah, so we come on here and we go, stop or my mom will shoot. That's a really good for a three star movie. Sure. You think, I mean, we sit there and watch, watch the film and we go, what is this film doing that is worth talking about? A film doesn't get made if it's not doing at least one thing right. Yeah. That's just not something that happens. There is no film that fails on every front. And I guess if it fails on every front, it becomes notable even in, in that, right? Yeah. There's yeah, there's really no uh, no failing across the board because then your board itself is uh, pretty notable. The only unworthy film is a film that never gets made. Well, look at you. Uh, so the two things that I wanted to talk about notability wise, um, one is uh, the '90s zeitgeist. Uh, <laughs> just in general. <laughs> yeah, just do we have a couple minutes to just talk about the entire I '90s love zeitgeist? The '90s zeitgeist. Blame it on the riots. Okay, so as I'm watching this movie, my obsession with the time and place just starts to take hold of me. Mm-hmm. I really thought, hey, we'll do Kindergarten Cop and stop her. My mom will shoot. And it'll just be a nice, I'll just coast, right? Sure. For the first time ever, I'm going to phone it in on double feature. It'll be super easy. And then I'm watching and true to form, stop her. My mom will shoot comes on and I get way fucking excited. Yeah. Right. I mean, some movies are, you know, they're a slow burn. And you get into them, and they're good or they're bad or whatever. They're for you. They're not for you. This movie starts, and it's a stop sign cartoon, and then the title, and then a little <laughs> cartoon thing playing in the lettering that goes kablamo. Yeah. I mean, it's it's one of those movies where you start watching, and five fucking seconds in, you go, oh my god, what did I sign up for? Yeah. Just this quick burst of excitement. And even if that's... You know, even if that's in humor for well, how bad could this possibly be, it's exciting nonetheless. The fact that a film can evoke that emotion is, man, I love that. Right. But then I start getting obsessed about time and place. I start thinking about, okay, the 90s, and here we're dealing with, uh, it's early 90s, we're talking about gangs, which are still, you know, at that time, still an abstract evil. They're not human yet. Right. Well, everybody's still wearing leather and chains and sunglasses and has a really, really punk haircut. Right, yeah. So there's these this fear that just, you know, counterculture is who the right. gangs are. Because we don't know who the gangs are yet. The gangs are still... I mean, you know, the police in real day America, real day and time America, no. But in film, we're still... There's still the no motivation, only exists at night, static kind of monster. Every gang just kind of looks like the warriors. Yeah, or, right. Or characters from Escape from New York. Right. Because people are still uncomfortable with the idea that it could be their neighbor. They want a little bit. They need to know that they could tell a punk gang walking down the street. Yeah. So we aren't in a spot where we can actually, you know, we could never tell a story about a gang from the perspective of a gang in this year in cinema. Right. Sure. We just don't know what it looks like enough yet to, to think about, I mean, think about a show like the wire, right? Uh Uh-huh. That show was very much about gang violence and drug dealing, and it was told, a lot of it, not necessarily from the perspective of the gang, but your camera spends time with them when there aren't any good guys around. Sure. 
you couldn't do that this year in cinema. You couldn't, uh, because the gangs are still, I mean, look at who's in these, look at who sells his mom's guns. Right, right. Right? They're still like these buffoon characters, and they're, you know, the guy comes in his home as an intruder, and they make him a home-cooked mm -hmm. meal, and he's like, sure. you know, he's a buffoon. He's comic relief. Well, plus, I mean, if you look at the other two henchmen that are the latter bad guys, they're equally goofy. Yeah. It's the, what, it's the yeah, lawyer definitely. from Jurassic Park? Uh-huh. And the one guy from that um, comedy duo that used to be in all the Ernest movies. You mean the guy from The Lost World? Yes. Yeah, and they're just, you know, the idea of pimps and drug dealers in this movie, they're so colorful and they're so, um, it's silly, honestly. It's just, it's just really silly. So that's part of it. It's the 90s, what do we think about gangs? Are they a faceless, you know, protagonist? I mean, still very much being a faceless protagonist. But then the other part is the Stallone part. And, you know, you talked about a lot of the movies uh, we did on our show. We had, we did uh, Death Race 2000 as well. I don't know if we've mentioned it. We can't go through this whole episode without mentioning that. No, that's that. true. But Stallone had that part in there, too. Well, Stallone is, is one of the few action guys that didn't start with action. Mm -hmm. He wasn't initially the tough guy. I mean, I guess in, in Death Race 2000, he's he's... A mobster. Well, Death Race was a pivotal point for me because I think everything after Death Race kind of felt like Stallone, the action hero. Yeah. I mean, once we got into him being, you know, once he was both Rocky and Rambo, there really wasn't any going back. The most we could do is put him next to Rob Schneider. You know. Yeah, that's true. That's how we made. <laughs> that's how we made Stallone funny. Is he was the straight guy because he might make a wisecrack, but for the most part, sure, brutal action hero. With, I guess, the one-off exception of Stop or My Mom Will yeah. Shoot. This is something where, I mean, I haven't seen Stallone's whole body sure. of work. But I've we've done maybe 10 of his movies on the show, and we've never seen him in anything like this. We've never even referenced him being in anything like this. <laughs> it's, uh, it's very much a one-off, especially considering where it was among his other films. You know, that makes it very much unlike Kindergarten Cop, where we saw Arnold starting to do a lot of these things, where they're kind of scattered throughout his film career. Right. Stallone it kind of starts in a, a more generic area, acting, comedy, drama, and then gets into this really, you know, fine honed, I'm not just an action star, but I am Sylvester Stallone. That's the type of action star I am. You know, this guy that would become enough of a model that later people would say, Oh, this action star, he's kind of a little bit, you know, he's a little bit uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's a little bit Sylvester Stallone. Yeah. He was kind of his own, I hate to use the word niche again, but that's, I mean, that's, that's what sort it, of what it, it is. You're going to eventually get into redundancy when you're talking about films from the 90s. Really? You think so? So you take this guy that's known for that, and while there is action in this movie, a very large amount of it is that piece we talked about with kind of demasculinizing. Right. And there was some of that in Kindergarten Cop, but this is really, I mean, that's the focus. If Kindergarten Cop had kind of these um, these other themes you found about parenting, sure. I feel like all of the themes in Stop or My Mom Will Shoot are about uh, demasculinization. You know, I think, I think it kind of deals with that, but I think it also deals with the backhanded agenda of do you have to be Stallone to be a real man? You think so? I mean, is a real man the kind of guy who, you know, can bite through a metal chain or is a real man the kind of guy who can speak his feelings to a woman to get his life on the right track? Who can call his mother and take her advice, right? Right. Yeah. Is, is where, where along the line do you become a real man? Is it when you're the best fucking crime stopping detective in the city or is it when you can swallow your mom's criticism and accept that she is a viable human being too. That's the funny thing, though, is I think that the movie's trying to tell us, okay, you don't have to be a macho guy to be a real man. Sure. But the way it does it is by taking a macho guy and demasculinizing yeah, no, him. I, I'm, I'm, yeah, no, I think you're dead on. That's what I'm talking about when I mean that's really the only theme, is I see what the movie's doing. I see where it's arriving and it's going... Hey, mom, you're cramping me, but you know what? You love your mother and you're supposed to listen to what she says right. and she actually knows what she's talking about. And those are all the things that's laying on you. But really what it's saying is, hey, stop being such a muscle head. <laughs> you know, you, how dare you act manly? 
And it's a it's a weird thing because we talk so much about feminism on this show. Yeah. And if we're ever going to talk about masculinity, I feel like it's either without intellect, it's just completely, hey, this is action and isn't it fun and awesome, or it's when they give a masculine role to a woman and that becomes particular, you know, haywire. Sure. Right? The things we've said about Jodie Foster. <laughs> I mean, when we're reversing gender roles in order to look at them, we don't spend a lot of time looking at masculinity because I don't, I don't, I don't know why we just don't, yeah. you know, there, there isn't as much to examine there in my mind. It's not as interesting to me. It's one of those things that it's pretty well understood. Um, masculinity sure. has kind of been the topic of film since film. It's not counterculture, you know, yeah. it's not yeah. a, it's if not a, get like a manly group of goth kids in a film. <laughs> maybe we'll cover that. Well, but that's because it's betraying a stereotype yeah, and exactly. that's why I wanted to talk about it here is because now we're starting to look at masculinity to tear it down yeah. and to make that, um, I don't know, just embarrassing and humiliating and what that might tell us about it. You know, what this movie, whether it's trying to or not, we have some pivotal points like uh, Stallone is having trouble with the woman in his office, right? right? Who's actually a little higher up than he is, who gives him orders which is uh, gender-wise something that's interesting to me because I'd, you know, it's hard for me to be on a film side if they're just going to paint women as you know, the stereotype. Right. Then it's not a movie I go to and go, okay, well, what does it say about gender roles? So it decides, okay, we're going to put this woman in a position of power just for whatever reason, just because, and then we're going to make Stallone have some problems with her and you know, their relationship with Spotty or whatever. And he starts to win her over by taking his mom's advice. Right. I don't know what that necessarily says about masculinity to the end purpose of the film. Uh, is the movie trying to tell us that not all women like a muscle-bound guy? Is it trying to tell us that our mother has great advice for us? It's, I think, to go back to what I was saying earlier, I think the overarching goal of the film is to try to prove that you don't need to be a macho guy to be a real man. I think it's it's trying to redefine man as a responsible and sensitive human being, but not by giving us a clear example right, of what exactly. that looks like. It's it kind of keeps saying what it's trying to get us to think and then going about the film the only way it can, which is to keep shitting on Sly Stallone's lifestyle. Well, the thing is though, when when you talk about okay, if the end purpose of the film, if part of their goal in making this is to go, all right, a gentle, softer, more intellectual man or a man who's more in touch with his feelings is more attractive to women. When Stallone becomes more of that man, he's funnier. We laugh at him more. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. That's why I don't know if I totally buy that. The movie tells us, get in touch with your, uh, what in the 90s they would call your feminine side. Right. Get in touch with your emotions and, you know, the women around you will love that and you'll be this great human being and you'll hurt your mother less and you'll have a lot of sex but that's also farcical it's also the point where we laugh at stallone they also go you know what would make you a buffoon and really funny is if you were in touch with your emotional side yeah you know and suddenly you're something to be mocked suddenly you're something worth making a movie about <laughs> well you're famous and mockable it's just something that's interesting about Stop or My Model Shoot. People are going to, you know, they're going to give this movie uh, 4% on Rotten Tomatoes because they think it's not funny or they think it's poorly, whatever they think. But I don't think a lot of people are going to consider the very mixed message on gender roles or on um, men being in touch with their emotions versus being macho guys. And a lot of that is really the interesting part of it too especially in the time capsule it's in yeah in the 90s because this is also a point where the way masculinity was portrayed in movies we weren't yet getting into that you know men in touch with their feminine side or the um what was the the word for late 90s or i guess it was probably even five years later south park had an episode on it uh where the fourth grade kids metrosexual oh. that's the word i'm looking for <laughs> right when we're talking about just, you know, the the iconic figure of man in society, what it's supposed to look like, what society right. holds up their men to uh, to look like. Back in Stop or My Mom Will Shoot days, women were still slapping men in movies. Mm -hmm. You know, that almost shocked me when I saw it. It was part of a bygone element of cinema. You don't see that a lot now where 
a man does something and a woman slaps him, his romantic love interest, you know, slaps him in the face. Right. And he didn't even really do anything in this movie. <laughs> he was wrongly accused of getting flowers because she jumped to conclusions and then he got smacked. Yeah. In a movie today, it would be considered domestic abuse. The website, I believe, is doublefeatureshow.com. And if you would like to email the creators of that website, um, that would be doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. It's true. Both those things are true. Uh, a couple weeks back, I think we plugged glittermouse.com. Any other glittermouse updates? We've got a Kickstarter that we're uh, trying to get together for, um, for our record that's supposed to be coming out in a couple months. Anything people can do in the meantime, go to the website, look at the stuff. Yeah. I mean, if you go to glittermouse.com, it's possible that by the time you are listening to this show this evening, the Kickstarter has already launched. I believe you said that last time you mentioned the Kickstarter. I'm pretty sure you said that a couple <laughs> weeks ago. I don't think this, we need a Kickstarter for our show. Yeah, we do. That's what we need. People asked us for an update on t-shirts a while ago. We don't have an update yeah, on t-shirts. Um, nobody's given us any money. And I feel bad coming on here and giving an update with the implication that seriously, guys, please give us some money. I don't really want to do that this week. I guess I kind of already am. So please give us some money. That's see, it's a slippery slope. And Michael. you know what? Regardless of whether or not you give us money, we're going to be doing two more films next week. Yeah. What are the movies we're doing? We're going to do nothing. And Freeway. You mean the film Nothing? The film Nothing. You mean the film Nothing by the people who made the film Cube. That's correct. And uh, Excellent. The, the film Freeway starring Reese Witherspoon and uh, a slew of other bizarre actors to see in a film with Reese Witherspoon. Hell yeah, Freeway. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's really cool. So uh, I guess watch more fucking film. Bye.